Welcome to Working Title, the podcast from Kent ISD that is yet to be named. My name is Keith Tramper, and I am an ed tech consultant here at Kent ISD, and I'm joined by our Director of Teaching and Learning, Kelly Brockway. We're excited to get this thing rolling. The topic for today is around the November issue of EL Magazine, which focused on cultivating educator efficacy. And specifically, we're going to look at efficacy in the face of adversity and go out from there. So uh, before we get into things, I wanted to ask a question that we can both answer and just to kind of get to know us a little bit as uh, we get started. But uh, the question is, what is one thing you hope for this year? And Kelly, I'm going to ask you to start. In terms of education as a whole, one thing I hope not only for this year, but for the future of education is just an overhaul in the system. We have this opportunity to really embrace a lot of the changes that we experienced. And I think that the teacher shortage crisis is just even more evidence of the urgency around needing just an overhaul of our the system, the way we mm-hmm. do things. Yeah, for sure. I think there's a little bit of opportunity in there to, to rethink how we do things for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think for me... Um, One of the things I've noticed is that through the pandemic, most of us have sort of fallen into our corners and the only connections we have are with the people we immediately see, or we fall into a space of following only on social media. So I'm hoping that we can, um, you know, develop further perspectives on what's going on in, especially in the world of education and sort of what you're saying, Kelly, like use those new perspectives, how we all experienced this pandemic or experienced education as a whole um, to refine the system and make it work better for us as educators and for students. I think the best analogy I had early in the pandemic was I was in a session and uh, the facilitator used the analogy that we're all weathering this storm, but that the boats that we're weathering this storm in are very different. Some of us are in these large yachts and we're uncomfortable, we're disrupted. And then we've got other people that are in lifeboats, for example, that are being tossed around in the waves and not really knowing from one day to the next what, you know, just all of the instability. And so while it's the same storm, we're all weathering it differently. And I think exactly to your point that just the importance of perspective. All right. So let's get into it. We're going to start with the article Efficacy in the Face of Adversity, written by Alexandra Flegging and Katie Egan Cunningham. Um, And I'm going to turn it over to you, Kelly, to kind of give us an overview of what this was all about and um, maybe some of the big things we should take from this article. Yes, I think that's what drew me to this article. And while the whole publication is full of amazing articles, this one really jumped out at me because, you know, I'm going to say that, you know, we're the unprecedented times, right? That we are not in normal times. The the self-efficacy or teacher agency that we've talked about or worked towards with our staffs um, up until this pandemic is different now. When we think about what this author calls the crisis efficacy, she's essentially talking about the belief in one's ability to succeed, not just every day, but in a crisis. And I think that what makes this crisis even more different than any other crisis we've experienced in education is just how long it is. It's the prolongedness of being under this much stress with this much change. And it's not just at work. It's Mm -hmm. at home too. I mean, it's everywhere. It's all around us. So enduring a crisis like this for so long, I was just drawn to really digging into what is crisis efficacy and how can we be supportive of our educators? Yeah, for sure. It's almost like we're looking at efficacy as you use the word enduring, that we have the efficacy that we can make it through this whole situation we're in right now, um, rather than we have efficacy in terms of we have control over what's happening in our classrooms, or we feel like we you know, have an impact in our classroom communities and school communities. Now we're focused more on we can make it through this <laughs> and our, we can still provide what's best for our students. Yeah. And I think it's important to know that when she talks about uh, crisis efficacy, It's a combination of self-efficacy, but also key components like resilience, well-being, emotionality, sociability, self-control. All of those other pieces impact one's crisis efficacy. 
And I think that if we solely focus on self-efficacy, we're missing some key points. She gets later into the article and talks from a research lens that really of all of those components, well-being had the highest impact. So I guess pushing back maybe on the publication as a whole, as its focus is on efficacy, this article is really saying crisis efficacy is really grounded in well-being. Not to say that self-efficacy doesn't have a role in that, but well-being had played a huge role in that. Mm -hmm. Our teachers' mental health is so, so important, and our learners' mental health too. How do you see well-being and mental health working together? Are they one in the same, or are they something that's kind of a different beast to tackle? Well, again, going back to the article, I loved how she notes right in the article that there's no consensus on a single definition of well-being. <laughs> <laughs> right? That so to say, mm -hmm. are they one and the same? I guess it depends on whose definition of well being that you're that you're really considering. Yeah. Um, but she does point out simply well being as the presence of positive emotions, mm -hmm. the presence of feeling contentment, and generally judging life positively. You know, in a nutshell, that's loosely how she's the lens with which she's looking at well being. So if you, you know, laid a mental health lens over that mental wellness lens over that you can definitely see correlation to that but when you say the presence of positive emotions ah i worry about toxic positivity there's an article mm -hmm. about that in here right i'm hearing you say this and i'm thinking of like what i think we all fear and that is we know that teacher uh, mental health is really important right now and teacher well-being is really important so we're going to spend some time during staff meetings or at professional learning opportunities to talk about how teachers should take care of themselves and then turn around and say, but then here's like 100 other things that we need you to do. And by the way, we're in a pandemic and you really need to do this now and take care of our kids and your family and whatever else you're doing. Gaslighting 101, right? <laughs> right, right. right, right. Self-care PD in the morning. And then here's a whole bunch of things you need to do and unrealistic expectations and timeframes in which to do them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering, I know you're in touch with a lot of the leadership in our area. How have you seen this done well? What things have you, are you taking from this article too, for how to, you know, not gaslight teachers and really <laughs> truly make sure you're getting at providing them space to, to work on their mental health? I think the first thing to do is just before you do something as a leader, make sure, take a step back, ask someone, maybe ask your core group of, of mentor teachers or teacher leaders in your building to really, truly, realistically reflect on what it is, you know, what that day looks like, that PD day looks like, for example. In the article, she talks about some key suggestions to improving well-being. One of them is emphasize balance in life. Okay, yes, we are really good right now at talking that. We need to walk that talk. I think that's where our next real step is, is we talk about mental health. We talk about self-care. We talk about having a work-life balance. But how do we walk the talk? How do we be a role model of that? How do we model that? You know, I, I'm thinking about my own actions. Yesterday, it's a snow day, and here I'm sending emails. I, I'm telling everyone to walk the talk and here I wasn't even walking the talk, emphasizing, you know, work-life balance. Like here was an opportunity unscheduled. I, in my opinion, snow days are your, are really your only ever, it's an unplanned day, nothing else. It's a vacation day. You got stuff scheduled, you know, it's a day off, planned day off. You've got appointments and other responsibilities at home. Like I always feel like snow days are like your actual only truly unscheduled free day. And here I was working sending emails. And so how, how can we do better job of modeling that? I loved in the article on page 74, she says her hope was that schools become places where self-sacrifice is no longer the measure of an effective educator. And I guess that's kind of what I meant back in the beginning when I was talking about just a system overhaul, hmm. yeah. make, you know, make the new norm, leave your work at school at the end of the day mm -hmm. and not put so many expectations on our teachers that that's not even a possibility. Hmm. Yeah. So as a leader, modeling it yourself, like showing how you balance and being able to um, share that as a leader in your building is important. But then also expecting that sounds like a really important thing, too, that it, I'm going to expect that you have balance and I'm going to give you the space to do that. And speaking about space, you know, one of her other suggestions was create meaningful gatherings. 
she references Priya Parker's work, The Art of Gathering, and stop doing things that that's just, we've just always done it that way. You know, we have a teacher staff meeting twice a month on Wednesday afternoons until five. Well, it's in our contract. That's the way we've always done it. And at these meetings, I tell you a whole bunch of stuff that could have been an email. And we do one size fits all professional learning that for half of you might not even be relevant or urgent or appropriate. (laughs) So how can we safeguard some of that time for teachers to utilize, to do the work that maybe they're essentially taking home so that they can have that work-life balance? I participated in the MEMSPA chat last night. It was a great discussion, but one of the things that we asked was what makes PD or any kind of professional learning effective? And almost to a T, every single principal in that group said that it needed to be relevant and it needed to be urgent. So two words that you just used, Kelly, right? Mm -hmm. We, We know that if we're getting together, if we're requiring time from our teachers, we really need to make sure it's something that is speaking to something they're going through right now and that they can use tomorrow and that it's something that is relevant to what they're doing in the classroom and what their learners need. Otherwise, why are we doing it, right? Well, and as a former principal and having been in those shoes, you get caught up in the day-to-day of the, of the school, layer in pandemic expectations on top of that. And then all of a sudden you look at your calendar and tomorrow's the staff meeting. And I think sometimes that's where we feel like as leaders that I need to fill that time. Many of us have been educators in classrooms and it's like, ooh, I'm not prepared for this. So how do I fill this time? (laughs) That's that's not what we want to do. So how can we be more intentional and more impactful? And essentially, the third suggestion she talks about in the article is modeling vulnerability. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how can we be vulnerable as leaders to say, I don't have anything planned for this? Take this time and use it for your planning. Now, critics would say that's unscheduled time. The teacher didn't know they were going to get that time. So it's not really useful necessarily. Um, You know, if you're going to give a teacher time, you're going to sub for them. You're going to give them extra time. Let them know ahead of time so they can make the most use of that time. But my one criticism of the whole article, though, she references Adam Grant's work. She references Priya Parker's work. During modeling vulnerability, ah, there's no Brene. Where's Brene Brown? (laughs) Yeah, that seems like something that would fit fit in pretty well with her article. (laughs) Yes. And the thing I loved the most about her part on modeling vulnerability, she says, educators cannot be well if we expect positivity at all times. Mm -hmm. So kind of going back to your toxic positivity. One thing that I think we can't lose sight of is around communication. You talked about meaningful gatherings, and especially right now when there's so much stress and teachers are covering each other's classrooms and dealing with lots of student behaviors that they maybe didn't have to deal with before, but giving teachers that space to just be in community sometimes is really helpful, especially for mental health, right? I think a lot of us feel better if we can speak with people who understand the things we're going through, even if there's no like solution to it in the end, just giving that space to talk and say, what are you doing? (laughs) How is this going? Or man, I'm really struggling with this. That's like the easiest form of therapy for teachers, especially when we're talking about mental health and well-being. And I think the article references Adam Grant, and he wrote a piece back in April and titled, there's a name for the blah you're feeling. It's called languishing. He calls it the neglected middle child of mental health and how it can dull your motivation and your focus and that it may be the dominant emotion of 2021. And what I love about Adam Grant is he's always a big proponent of a non-binary view of the world of, of issues. You know, it's not one or the other, that there's really this continuum. And he does that with with this idea of languishing. John Spencer wrote a blog. He talks about a continuum as well, that it's not I'm burnt out or I'm not, but that there can be a continuum of how I'm feeling right now in 2021. How is my crisis efficacy? (laughs) You know, where am I at on the continuum? And another perspective that I appreciated that's not referenced in the article, but it was a response to Adam Grant's piece on languishing was Austin Kleon. He wrote the book, Feel like an artist. It's a great read if you haven't read it, but he responded to Adam Grant's piece and his is titled, I'm not languishing, I'm dormant. 
And he compared it to like a plant in the winter. Like if you look at it, it looks dead. It looks like it's definitely languishing. And he talked about how we shouldn't expect it to flourish in bad conditions. It's not, it's not meant to flourish in the winter, but give it the right conditions. Give it that temperature and the sunlight and all of those other pieces. And it will flourish. And so if we look at that perspective right now, you know, isn't that what education is right now? We're in a perfect storm of, <laughs> of certain conditions and, you know, expecting a teacher to flourish right now. And again, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning about a system overhaul and, and honestly, a societal overhaul of how we view educators, expecting them to flourish right now under these conditions. Same with our kiddos. This pandemic is impacting us, not just at school, but everywhere. And mm -hmm. I think it's important that we, that we consider that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we really dug into um, this article specifically, but the whole publication, the EL publication every month is full of amazing articles all around. So Keith, was there another article that you would really encourage people to maybe dig into that really stuck out to you? Yeah. One that jumped out to me was the one on toxic positivity. Um, and that's the collective efficacy or toxic positivity. Man, I can't speak that. Um, but it's by Paul Emmerich France. And I think toxic positivity has been something that stood out to me as an interesting topic. We, we talked a little bit about gaslighting, and that's definitely a big part of it. But this article just digs so deep into it, and we don't have enough time to really get into all of it here, but it's definitely worth a read. And I guess the one big thing that I took away from it is we mentioned that community idea. And right now we've, we've been circling the wagons and calling in teachers, calling in students, calling in the community and asking them, okay, what are you feeling? What's your experiences right now? And what are your suggestions for how we handle this? And I think the worst thing we can do is just take that data and do nothing with it. The other part of efficacy is making sure that we are listening to what our constituents are asking for and making sure that we're doing something with it and taking heed of the advice and suggestions that are given to us. That's the big thing that I took out of that article, but there's a lot more there. So I highly recommend that you go check that out. What about you, Kelly? What article stood out to you? Yeah, the one that I'm thinking that comes to mind for me was titled The Critical Element of Self-Efficacy by Chase Milkey. I specifically loved the quote, rewards of free coffee and donuts are always welcome. <laughs> but what teachers want more is affirmation that their practice is making a difference. And it immediately reminded me of this article by Steve Gruner, School Culture, School Climate. They are not the same thing. And he talks in that article about how climate is like attitude and culture is like personality. And donuts on one day changes the mood for that day or a snow day, right? Snow day today. woohoo! But the culture is more like the personality. It's going to take time. It's going to need to evolve. So I liked that mentioned. But like Keith said, there's a lot to dig into um, in this piece. I'd really encourage you to check it out. I liked how they mentioned that we might know what a teacher needs to do to improve or an educator, a leader, knowing the what we need to do, not hard. We know we know what that is, but how do we model that and support the how, how we grow into that. And that's the part where this article really has some, you know, four major sources that influence that sense of self-efficacy. And he has a nice little reflection figure in there. So I would really encourage people to jump into that article if they have time. Well, thanks for listening to our discussion today. We're excited about this series and we have already started thinking about our next podcast on the next issue of the ASCDEL publication. Uh, the focus of that one is engage and motivate. So excited to dive into that um, for next series. Our whole goal is to make this valuable for you. So we would love it if you would provide any kind of feedback you'd like to do that. You can reach out to us at our emails or Twitter. My email is keithtramper at kentisd.org. And my Twitter is at tramperk. Kelly, what's your stuff? My email is kellybrockway at kentisd.org. And my Twitter is at kellypage44. And if you have any ideas for our title of our podcast, that would be a, that's some great feedback. We would love your ideas. That is all for today. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time on whatever this podcast ends up being called. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is produced and edited by Keith Tramper and Kelly Brockway as a service of Kent ISD. 
we are ASCD members, but otherwise not affiliated with ASCD or the EL publication. For more information from the episode, including links to the articles we discussed, please check out our show notes. Our theme music is Make It Work from All Good Folks, courtesy of Upbeat.io. I feel like one of those people that turn their camera on and they just breathe. <laughs> like the little kids. <laughs>